Maybe it's just a name, a unique name. And, and I know sometimes people go, well, what's the in thing to do? It's like, you know, when you're going to paint your house, it's like, what's the in color? Well, it's the in color this year, just not going to be the in color next year. So you can name your child based on, you know, what's the most popular name for 2022. But in 2025, it'll be like, why did you name your child that? Right? Well, how do you come up with a name? Now, in the Bible, sometimes, I don't think all the time, but sometimes the name was relevant. The, the, the parents would think, I want to name my child after someone important. Maybe some biblical figure, some ancestor that's done great things. Maybe they've named their child quite often, if it was a son, after the father. Be a similar name. You remember even when John the Baptist was born, everybody's wondering, well, what are we going to name this child? You know, Zachariah would make sense. That's his dad's name. And everybody's saying, well, that's the name, Zach. But nobody called him Zach, right? His name's John. People are like, well, who named him John? Now, today, John's quite a popular name. Mark's a quite a popular name, right? So even some biblical people have common names. So we're going to look at this idea of, well, what is your name? Because that, that's kind of important. As we look at this event, Jesus just sailed across the Sea of Galilee. And there was a great storm, and Jesus calms the storm, and now they're arriving on land, and out comes from, it says, the tombs. There was a man there who was demon-possessed. He was met there by a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but lived among the tombs. This guy was in rough shape, right? He was kind of rejected by society. He could not even live in the city. He, he, he didn't have any family that would come out and meet with him. Didn't, probably didn't have any friends. Sometimes they would live together, even people that were um, demon-possessed. Just as the lepers sometimes would gather together if they all had leprosy. They have, they have something in common. Isn't that kind of sad that the only way you're identified is by the group you hang out with and y'all have demons, or maybe even you all have leprosy. That's how you identify yourself. That's, that's how you say, this is who I am. This is my identity. But this is the man. He's been struggling for a long time. Could you imagine somebody living in a condition like, you'd wonder, how did he get things to eat? But somehow he was taken care of. He was in a desperate situation. He had tried, perhaps, many things, and other people maybe have wanted to help him. He lived among the tombs. This is from Mark chapter 5. And no one could bind him anymore. It sounds like at one point, it's kind of like, well, let's see if he can kind of live among us. But, you know, we have to put some restraints on him. But at least we can be in his company. We can go visit him. But if he's not bound at all, you don't really want to be there because who knows what he's going to do, what he's going to say. Maybe he'll get violent. That's the only reason you'd want to bind somebody like this. But they tried. Couldn't even bind him with a chain. He'd often been down, bound with shackles and chains. In other words, it seems like people were trying to control him. But he could not be controlled at all. He would ret, uh, wrench, wrench the chains apart. He broke the shackles into pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. This is, this is the man now that Jesus encounters... As he comes upon the shore, this man runs up to Jesus. Very similar to another man we looked at a few weeks ago. A man who would run up to Jesus and fall down. It was last week. On his knees. To identify who Jesus is. And that's what this man did. He was quite observant. He was quite aware of the power of Jesus. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, cutting himself with stones. I mean, just think about his life. And I would imagine most of us would say, you know, that doesn't really describe my life. That, that's not me. I, I'm certainly not someone who's demon-possessed, who has this kind of activity in my life. But what about insight? What about inside? I mean, how much control do you have over your emotions, over your attitudes, over your outbursts, over the things that seem to control you? 
almost we feel like there's forces that are controlling me. And I mean, kind of Paul said that. I, there's things that I want to do and I don't do them. I don't even really know why, but I don't do the things that I want to do. And there's things that I don't want to do and those are the things I end up doing. Who's controlling me? Is there something going on on the inside maybe that I've not really dealt with? I've not really looked at. And it's really controlling me. And so Jesus kind of wants to get at the heart of the matter as he's engaging with this demon-possessed man. Listen to what Jesus says. What is your name? Now, if someone asked you, really, what is your name? Now, you may say, oh, my name's Peter. But this man could not even identify himself by really what his name was. You know what he's naming? He's naming what's going on in the inside. Now, Jesus... As he's talking to this man, sometimes when Jesus talks to demon-possessed people, there's an interaction with like literally two different people. There's the demon himself, and then there's also the human being, the flesh, the person. Now, I don't know exactly who Jesus is talking to now. Maybe he is literally talking to the demon inside, or maybe he's talking to the man saying, you know how I identify myself? You know how I see myself? You know how I view myself? I see myself as a demon-possessed person. That's just all I am. That's, that's me. Who am I? Demon possessed. But he's a man, seems to be, wants to be free. Demon does not want to be free, but he wants to be free. So I bring this up because in our society, sometimes there's people that want to assign us a name. Sometimes the name is based on an attribute we have. You're very short, you get a name. You're very large, you get a name. You're not very smart, or maybe you're poor, or maybe you're rich. Maybe you've had some trouble. Maybe you've had a lot of mistakes. So sometimes people would even look at others and say, that person is a thief. That person over there is a drunk. That person over there is an adulterer. And that person over there is a liar. And there's cheats and there's gossips. Sometimes people attach names to us. Even sometimes, sometimes parents can attach names. Or maybe even a coach at school. Or maybe a teacher. Or maybe even friends that we had. You remember growing up, sometimes they assigned names to people. You'll never amount to anything. You're too slow. You, you can never succeed. You'll never make the team. You'll never go to college. You'll never be self-supporting. You'll never get through this. But instead, you'll always be lazy. You'll always be someone who doesn't care. You'll always be someone who runs away from problems. You'll always be somebody who cannot hang on to any relationship. And sometimes we hold on to those names. Maybe this guy, how is he ever going to get rid of this name he has? My name is Legion. Because there's many demons inside. That's me. But we want to be free. What name are we carrying around? Maybe even as adults from our childhood. Or maybe a name that we've imposed on ourselves. You ever done that before? You know, people, you know, in your mind, you may say, you know what I am? I'm an alcoholic. Well, no, you're not. You're somebody who's free that used to have a problem with alcohol. You know who I am? I'm an adulterer. No, no, I'm not. I am somebody who's faithful. And in the past, I had a problem. But that's the past. You know who I am? I'm a thief. No, I'm not a thief anymore. I'm somebody who's honest. Instead of taking, I give. But in the past, I, I'm still aware of what was in the past. But I'm not that anymore. It's not attached to me anymore. It's, it doesn't define my life anymore. Because now I'm new. I haven't changed. I've been forgiven. 
I am free. That's what this guy wants. He wants to be free. Seems like we've tried a lot of things to be free. It seems like he's tried a lot of things to be free. But now Jesus comes. Let's see what happens when Jesus comes, when Jesus enters the picture, when Jesus says, you know, I can give you a new name. And especially for the, for the little ones here today. You may think, well, I, you know, I've already been assigned a name by my friends. Or by a relative. Or by somebody I know. But you know, it doesn't have to be your name that you're going to carry the rest of your life. You can just say, that's what somebody else thinks. That's not what God thinks. God knows that I can overcome. God knows that I can do better. God knows that I'm just in the process of growing. God knows that, that this is not the end. This is just the beginning. This is, this is not where I'm going to be forever. I'm, I'm going to be out of this in a while. I'll be a different person. And I can change by the power and the grace of God. And this name doesn't have to define me throughout the rest of my life. And think about this man, demon-possessed, if only he could be free. And that's kind of the rest of the, the, this story that even the demons are realizing we've got to leave. We cannot possess this man anymore. And that, that's, you know, it's kind of interesting as this man runs up to Jesus and falls at his feet. Again, was that the man running up to him? Or was that the demon? Well, you think the demon would run the other way. They realize Jesus is coming. So at least this man may have some control to go to Jesus, fall on his knees. But the demon, what does the demon want to do? Well, the demon does not want to be banished forever. So the demon says, you know, would you, instead of sending us to the abyss, we'll go into the pigs across the way. Which is... An interesting parallel, isn't it, where demons ought to go in the Jewish mind? What do we think of pigs, right? The unclean animals. And demons are unclean. That's where they would go. Demons do not belong in people. And yet we think, well, maybe we don't say we're demon-possessed, but sometimes we feel like there's some kind of a, a devilish thing. Maybe there is some kind of a demon in my life. We talk maybe loosely about that, not literally, we feel controlled, but we want to be free. So what is your name? What is it you're holding on to? What is it that you find so difficult you cannot be free, that you've now defined your life on this is who I am? And it's based on, what, the work of Satan? Why won't we come to Jesus and say, I want to be free? I want to be forgiven. I want to be restored. I want to be in my right mind. I want to be back into relationship with other people. I want to be able to go and worship God. I, I want to be back with my family where I belong. I want to be able to contribute to society in a very positive and a meaningful way. I want something better. Well, how's that going to happen? It comes from surrendering ourselves to God and believing in him. So an example of this kind of struggle, if you remember in the book of Daniel, this is when the Jewish people were led into captivity in Babylon, and there was a, a few of the young men, and some of them were even of noble families. And we don't know exactly of Daniel's background, but we have a little bit of an idea of who he was and how that happened, that he ended up in Babylon Daniel chapter 1 talks about they took youths, youths without a blemish, good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning, competent to stand in the king's palace, and to, they were to teach literature and language of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, this is what they were doing. This is the kind of people they wanted. This was Daniel, one of these people. A youth. We don't know how old he was. Some people say somewhere between 15 and 18 years old. Could you imagine being taken away from your family? Being isolated. And yes, you're with maybe a couple of other guys from the city of Jerusalem, but you're pretty well alone in Babylon. And you know what they were doing? They would give him daily portion of food, 
drinking the king's wine, educated for three years, to stand before the king. And this is the scripture from Daniel chapter 1, verse 7. They changed his name. They changed his name from Daniel to Belshazzar. They changed his name. And the idea of this name change is to somehow, if we could change his name, and we could change where he's learning, and we can change who he's with, and we can change what he reads, and we can change the way he's educated, and we can change the song he sings. If we can change things about his life, we can change him. I mean, the idea was not to have, uh, you know, a Jewish man from Jerusalem living in Babylon. It was to convert him to the way of the Babylonian Empire, the, uh, the uh, Babylonian system, and the Babylonian gods. That's the idea. They wanted to change him, and they did it by wanting to change his name, his identity. So they said, we're not going to call you Daniel anymore. Daniel is God, is my judge. But we're going to call you Belshazzar, which means Prince of Bel, the Prince of our God. I mean, pretty close to saying the Prince of Satan. The young man who is going to be transformed into somebody completely different. So you have to understand that even in our world today, that maybe there's people trying to change the way you think what you believe, the way you live, the way you act and react, change who you worship, your values. Ultimately, they want to change your name. That's your identity, who you are, to make you into something completely different so that you'll no longer serve God, but that you'll be useful in the kingdoms of the world. And for some people... Think about it. If Daniel succeeded and did well, and he said, okay, well, I'll forget about Jehovah, and, and I'll, I will assimilate very well into this world, I can go places. I can be successful. I can climb the ladder. But without God. But he remained faithful, and God blessed him. And he, he, he was very powerful. Second powerful man in all of Babylon. He was faithful. But don't, don't get to thinking that if I'm faithful, then everything's going to work out for me. If I'm faithful, I will be successful. If I'm faithful, I will be able to get whatever I want in the world. You know, for Daniel, that happened. I mean, for Joseph, you remember him in the old time? It happened for him. But in other words, we're not saying, well, I want all the things of the world, so I'm going to be faithful to God. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not a deal we're making out with God. We're faithful to God, and God will be with us no matter what happens, whether it's success or it's defeat, whether we're doing well or things fall apart. Whether we're healthy or whether we're sick. Whether we're rich or poor. Whether we're the boss or the servant. It doesn't matter. We are going to be faithful to God no matter what. And that's what Daniel did. Although they tried to change everything about him. Even at a teenage year. He was able to be faithful to God. To put him first. To seek him to not forget all the things that he had learned when he was growing up in Jerusalem. A faithful young man. He would not allow his name to be changed. So we look at our lives to say, what does God want to do with us? What is the name that God's given us? Failure. You're a sinner. You're not loved. Nobody cares. You're unworthy. You're never going to make it. You're too old. Or maybe you're too poor. Or maybe you're not popular enough. Or you don't have that many friends. Or you're not gifted. We can think of all kinds of things that we're not. But think about the things that we are. 
Because this is the most important thing. Most important thing. The most important thing is not what do other people think my name is? What do they call me? What do they think about when they think about me? That's not, that's not that important. It's a little important maybe because you're concerned about that. Not that important. Do you know it's not even that important to think, well, what do I think about myself? You know, how do I define myself? Who, what, you know, what have I done? And how do I fit in? And what about me? And eh. Okay, okay, okay. That's important. It's just not that important. You know what's really important? You know what's the most important thing? This is a question to ask. What does God think of me? When God thinks of my name, what does God think? I mean, is he angry? Is he upset? Is he ready to scold me? Or do I think, God accepts me. He loves me. He's redeemed me. God wants to change me. God, God wants to take me for who I am and to say, okay, we're starting there. But from here on, we can grow. We can get better. We can get stronger. We can get smarter. We can make better choices. We can have better relationships. We can learn how to worship. We can learn how to love people. So when I'm in a right relationship with God and I understand what God thinks of me and how he assesses me, then I can say, well, you know, in and of myself, not that important. I'm not that big. I'm not even that valuable. But in God's eyes, I know that I'm very loved, cared for, I'm very valuable in God's sight. So all of a sudden, my value of what I think about myself goes up because I know God loves me. That's the most important thing. And if I know God loves me and I can actually accept myself even though I'm continuing to grow, then maybe that's going to help me kind of love other people. I can see other people better. And maybe not be so effective, affected by what they think about me or even what they say about me. Not that big of a deal. Because God has called me to a new name. I mean, that's why we oftentimes call ourselves not just a disciple, but we call ourselves a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I belong to Christ. I've been bought by the blood of Christ. I'm a new person. And I've got a new name that God has given me that I will never forget. And it's going to define me. It's going to change me. It's going to grow me. It's going to help me. It's going to strengthen me when I'm weak. And it's going to guide me when I'm lost. It's the name that God gives. And that's what we're talking about. A name. In the book of Acts, there was a man named Joseph, but we don't really know Joseph because we never call him Joseph. We call him Barnabas. And Barnabas was given that name because his name was Joseph, but it was his nickname, we would say. And he had a nickname because of the way he acted. He encouraged people. He helped people. He built people up. He worked with Paul. He worked with Timothy. He worked with John Mark. He worked with a lot of different people, but it seemed like wherever he went, he helped people, blessed people, strengthened people, walked beside people, served people, he even sacrificed for people. We see that in Acts 4, but he was also a man of encouragement. Just his name changed. He now has a nickname because of who he is. So when we're thinking about a different name, we're not thinking about getting worse, we just think about getting better. Of how can God use me? Maybe not just like us all together, but me individually, because I'm a different person than you. I have different gifts, abilities, talents, personality. I'm just a different person than you. What is God going to do in my life? Could God give me a name? Maybe a teacher. Maybe a leader. Maybe an administrator. Maybe a servant. Maybe it would be an encourager. Maybe it would be somebody who shows mercy, hospitality, grace to people. There's all kinds of opportunities we have to serve God. We, we know who we are. We've been called by God. We've been given ministry. We've been given gifts. We've been given opportunities. But here's a man who his name was literally changed based on who he was. 
So as we close, we're thinking about Romans chapter 12. And it seems like sometimes, you know, we have lessons on Romans chapter 12, and it just seems like they're every week. So we have not, we've not talked about Romans chapter 12 in, in a while. But verse 2 says, why don't you be changed? Why don't you change the way you think? The way you believe? The way you view other people? The way you view yourself? Why don't you change your mind? Well, how are we going to do that? Well, it's going to be done through Christ, right? So we're not going to let the world conform us to teach us, to try to mold us. I've got a new way of thinking. I'm going to renew my mind. Renew my mind in God's word. Renew my mind in God's spirit. Renew my mind in Jesus Christ. I have a new mind. I have a new nature. I have a new life. And that's going to change everything about me. The way I think, the way I feel, the way I act, the way I speak, my attitudes, the way I love, the way I serve, the way I give. It's going to change everything. Because I'm not trying to change outside stuff. It starts inside, in the mind, in the heart, being a brand new person. That's what being a Christian is all about. Just to me to say, I'm going to surrender my life so that Christ can live in me. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that I've been crucified with Christ. I've died with Christ. I've emptied myself. I've put that old man aside. I've buried him. And now I've been raised to live a brand new life in Christ. Now Christ lives in me. And that's what a Christian is. Somebody who's just said, I'm going I'm to give up the way of the world and being conformed by the world and living by the world. I'm just going to die to me and I'm going to live for Christ. That's kind of ties up the two words of making Jesus the Lord of my life and even the word repenting of my sin, repenting of living according to the world system. I'm going to live for God's kingdom. Now Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that we who have been baptized into Christ, we've been buried into his death and we've been raised just as Christ was raised from the dead to live a new life. Everything is new when we surrender to Christ. That happens when we make him the Lord. We repent of our sins. We confess. We're baptized into Christ. We can be new. What is that? A new name. A new nature. A new spirit. A new person. Everything is new. No longer according to the world, but according to God. If we can encourage you today as we think about making a decision. We're going to sing a song. I've heard the joyful sound that Jesus saves. It's his name. His name that is above every name. At his name every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If today you're ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And to be baptized into Christ to start the, the, the new life that comes because of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. We'll stand and we'll sing the song. Let us know how we can be a blessing to you today.